His father was Hank Snow. If y'all watched the movie, he was depicted in the movie in a non-factual way. Jimmy, let me ask you, we're going to start with this. Have you ever worn eyeliner and made your hair like Elvis and danced on tables? I did, yes. You did, actually? Okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, turn, turn that we, we, we all did that. <laughs> yes. I'm sorry. Yes. sorry. There you go. Yes. Yeah, we all did that. You did? Yeah. <laughs> uh, very first time I ever saw him, uh, I was sent to Lubbock, Texas by Parker. A lot of people are not aware of the fact that uh, Parker was uh, Eddie Arbel's manager. And by the way, I'm Jimmy Snow. It's nice to be here. And it's nice to be here. If during this time uh, there's a question should pop up on something I'm talking about, please feel free to raise your hand and, and uh, I'll try to answer that or talk about it, whatever it be the case, because it's a kind of an informal thing we're doing here today anyway. And, this is the first time I've ever really done that other than do it, doing it as interviews on uh, various programs and things of that sort. And since the movie came out, I'm getting a lot of attention on it all of a sudden. Not that I really care all that much about it, but uh, I left that world a long time ago. And I'm going to try to break this up into three things. Uh, if we had the time, there's just a lot of things that I could show you and, and uh, will and they're involved in many stories. My father was a very ardent collector of taking uh, eight by 10 pictures, black and white back in the days he was in the business. So he's also got 16 millimeter film of which I have 16 and a half hours from 1948 all the way down to 1977, some of it narrated by him. And I'm trying uh, during the off times that I have to be able to uh, edit these things together and uh, put some DVDs out or however you know people would want them and uh, in Nova Scotia where we're all from Canada I was born in Halifax Nova Scotia in the eastern part of the country dad was born in a little area known as Brooklyn Nova Scotia mother was born in Kentville Nova Scotia so we're all from that territory and we crossed the border like so many did. And uh, mother and I made our crossing into the United States in 1948 when dad sent for us and he was in Dallas, Texas at the time. So if you come up with any questions, just raise your hand up and I'll, I'll try to come to all of you. So we'll try to break this into three parts. I want to start out by just telling you a little bit about our background. Uh, where we came from, we were poor as Job's turkey and had very little when we started out. So I know what the hunger days are like. And I, I understand. So you got to realize that my times of running with Elvis Presley were in the 50s. So I don't know anything after 1958. Okay? Nothing about all of the things that I've heard about him, all of the things that he obviously. Uh, that people wrote about that he got into and troubles that he got into. I never saw any of that. He was a perfect gentleman in the years that I worked with him, from, which would have been from 1955 in February all the way up. My last time to see him was at Graceland. He had just bought a, a brand new home and he called me on the phone and said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm not doing much of anything. Why? I just got back from California. And my career was doing well. And uh, I had just appeared on the Lawrence Welk television show and I was looking for uh, uh, it on my, my iPhone. I have one of these little things that plug into the back of your iPhone. I ran off and forgot it. And I was actually hoping to be able to project it up on that screen so there will always be another time, and when we do it, uh, maybe I'll be able to project it up and show you a lot of films of things that we did back in those days. Films that most people have not as of yet seen because they were on my dad's 16mm uh, films, and I have them all, 16 and a half hours of them. <clears throat> and so maybe one of these days, God willing, I'll be able to put it all together and, and uh, uh, show it to people. But Dad is like Elvis in Nova Scotia. There's a big museum there. 
that every year this month, I think will be some 20 years that they've been doing it. It is in a train station where my dad was out on his own at the age of 12. You've got to understand, he only had a fifth grade education. He was self-taught, very driven, very private, and uh, everything about my father was just like this. Had to be right on key. He was a time freak, of which I'm kind of that way, worried me today. <laughs> we had a bad night, my wife and I did. We had a lot going on and a lot of phone calls and things going on and problems that, you know, we all have, don't we? And it kept us awake and everything, and so we just kind of overslept a little bit, jumped in the car, got very little sleep. And uh, it looked like we were going to be getting here a little after 5 o'clock. But we made it all right. So we thank God. We prayed about it. I said, Lord, you know, this is, you opened this door. You wanted me to go. So you take care of us and get us there. And so we got here on time. And they I, drove in from Nashville. Yeah, all drove right. in. And, and uh, thank God for that. How old are you, Jimmy? I'm 86 now. Jimmy oh, wow. drove in from Nashville. Yeah. He's 86. <laughs> I'm still preaching. <laughs> by the way. But I wanted, can I interject something? Yeah. What he was talking about a while ago, in the movie, I just thought this was interesting. And when I saw the movie, I called Jimmy. And I said, Jimmy, in the movie, they've got Gladys cussing. They've got Elvis cussing. And they've got Gladys drinking liquor. They've got Elvis drinking and going. He's, and tell them, Jimmy, tell them about that. You rode with Elvis in the car exactly. on the tour. Exactly. And, I, and I you were doing that. drugs, you were drinking, drinking you were doing cussing, all kinds of stuff. Everything. Was Elvis <laughs> doing that? No. No, I never no. saw I never saw him do any of that <laughs> stuff. Like I said at the beginning, yeah. is a good possibility that they may have been telling some stories in the latter couple of years of his life that he might have uh, actually had happen. But you've got to remember he was a strong Memphis churchgoer. I happened to preach a revival in his church for his pastor, a man by the name of Jim Hamill. How many of you heard the story about the quartet he tried to join, Elvis tried to join, and they Song wouldn't fellows. have it? Mm -hmm. Remember that? Song fellows. Right. Well, that turned out to become the Kingsman Quartet down the line, and the pastor of the church at that time was a man named Jim Hamill. And Jim Hamill's son, Jim Hamill Jr., was the one that started the Kingsmen by taking that bunch and putting them together. And they became pretty famous. And I'm sure they would have loved to have been able to have Elvis in that quartet. Talk about it a little bit later. He was only popular when that first record came out, That's All Right Mama, and Blue Moon of Kentucky on Sun Records. He was only popular here in Memphis, parts of moving towards Nashville, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, East Texas, Arkansas, that was it. It grew, but that's how it started out with him when we met him, all right? And, but Parker saw the potential there, and because so many of the artists that were on the package show, let me explain the package show to you. That's when you have two or more stars on the same uh, show. They would have the main star, which would have been my father, then maybe Marty Robbins under him. Marty Robbins would have been coming along in the entertainment business, doing well, one of my favorites actually, doing well, but not, not a big record seller yet, not at that point, but it, people knew him. Slim Whitman, uh, Farron Young, uh, uh, different people like that, which were you know entertainers uh, of that day. Uh, Almo Carter family, they were all people that were part of our shows. And so Parker said, this is what we'll do. We'll go out and do these 20, 30 day tours in package shows. But he said, we need to bring in some young people, some new blood. And so he started looking around. So we got to work a show with Tommy Sands, who was a brand new star. And uh, he heard about Elvis over here by getting around. So he approached Elvis and asked Elvis, why don't you We'll pay you whatever your amount is that you want, and you travel on these tours with Hank Snow, which was an open door for him, and it was an open door for him. Purpose, exposure to new territories, 
because over in Virginia, over in Jacksonville, Florida, uh, places up north, northeast, and so forth, they didn't know who Elvis Presley was yet. He was not known. So therefore, Parker thought this is a good way to get the new ones exposure, also referring to me. I was on those same shows for those two years that we traveled together. He also performed at the Jimmy Rogers Day celebration in Meridian, Mississippi. I don't know if you're aware of that or not, but Jimmy Rogers, whom I'm named after because he was my <clears throat> father's hero. Dad wanted to be just like Jimmy Rogers, learned to play the guitar like him, learned to yodel like him, and all. of course that changed over a number of years. But he named his only son Jimmy Rogers Snow. So that became my stage name. Because of political expediency, I wound up getting a record contract after 15 when I quit the church. So I wound up with a three-year RCA Victor contract. Well, even Elvis didn't have that yet. And of course, Dad, he's going to do all that he can. Now, why in the world would he want to sell RCA Victor on taking on a new artist by the name of Elvis Presley if he's jealous of him and didn't like it? Okay? So let that roll around in your mind for a little while. So he thought this was a great idea, bringing these young people on. I met him backstage at the Grand Ole Opry in November 1954. Parker brought him over. So I can tell you a little bit more about that directly. Parker brought him over, see how he would do on the Opry, and Dad used his influence to get him a guest shot because Jim, Jimmy, the guy that ran the Opry that was manager, didn't know who Elvis Presley was. Jim Denny. Jim Denny. So he had to put pressure there and say, you know, need to put him on. So backstage, in a dressing room, after Elvis did his part, which by the way, he bombed the first night. But so did my father. So that's no big deal. The people were very fussy in those days. And so uh, he went and did his part. He was hurt about it, of course, because everything he did was bombar bombastic, right? And people loved him. And uh, when he hit the stage, Doss, Dad saw that right off of the bat. So did I. Now, in the movie, they've got me pretty much being the one that kind of halfway discovered him. That's not true at all. I can tell you that right off of the bat. I carried a letter of intent to Lubbock, Texas, on a show that Parker booked me on for one reason and one reason only. He had already talked to Elvis to see if Elvis would work a series of tours with my father and the other entertainers. Well, he'd be crazy not to because he's not thinking about rock and roll because it wasn't even mentioned yet. He's thinking I'm a hillbilly country singer. So, and he knew he had a great memory and he memorized many of my father's songs and sang him for him in dad's office. So he, he knew a lot about who Hank Snow was. And so it wound up that I'm standing there, I, I'm, on, I'm, on, I'm on before him because he's the headliner. So I go out and do my bit. There was a thousand people, so they give you an idea how famous he was at that time. A thousand people came out to hear him to buy tickets because he's the headliner. So it hadn't started. This is, uh, this is a thing that's going to move on a little at a time, but quite fast, I might add. So he wound up that I stand there after I'm through and I'm watching. There was, Buddy Holly was on before me. And so I do my part and I go and I stand off to the side of the stage. I still remember what he wore. Chartreuse jacket with black pants and white stripes down the side. I also still remember the one kind of butch oil that he, you know, that people that have crew cuts, they want their hair to stand up, you know. He heard about that. He'd lose, do the brill cream on the sides, but here in the front, he put that other stuff on there. Why? So that when he'd shake his head, it'd fall down just right. You know? <laughs> and of course, the, the ladies would go nuts, right? Now let me tell you right off of the bat, my friend, I watched those women that night. And I want you to know, they weren't just teeny boppers. We all think that Elvis Presley appealed only to the teeny boppers, and that he was the man that came along for the teeny boppers of that day. That kind of added on later. It didn't happen right off of the bat. But I watched a woman in a, it was in February, and I watched a woman in a beautiful fur coat 
costly fur coat, jump out of her seat and leave her husband sitting there. And I'm standing on the side of the stage, and I'm watching her and a few others rush to the stage when he got to singing. He was a man for a time. And because of his ability, which as you all know that have studied Elvis, you know that he uh, not only was an unbelievable charismatic young man, handsome young man, good singing young man, sang on pitch type guy, but everything kind of was like an accident. It was an accident that got that hesitation, that uh, reverb sound in his voice, which he dropped in later years. But in the beginning he used it a lot because it caught on. And uh, I watched him, and so my purpose was, would you be interested? They don't want you to talk to anybody else about anything until you can talk negotiation with Hank and Colonel Parker. Now, Dad, it's the purpose of this check. All checks in that day, in this day too, have a little place called for, what the check's for. Here's what it says. 50% interest in Jamboree attractions as per partnership agreement between Thomas A. Parker and Hank Snow. Signed by my name it was the last payment of $1,250 that my dad gave to him. They amalgamated Jamboree attractions and Hank Snow Enterprises at the same time. This is what I carried as a letter of intent. Now why? That's so they, he won't talk to anybody else. He signed it. I brought it back, gave it to Parker. Parker's already managing Dad. He's already managing me. I'm already on RCA. I'm beginning to move along. We're working package shows already. So now, with that in mind, Elvis decides, okay, don't forget now, back in that day and time, an artist could not sign a contract that was a major contract, such as RCA or with the two companies, if you're under 21. I was 19 at the time, he was 20. Okay? So he had to have his mother and father sign the contract along with him. What I have here in this book is the contract between my father and Parker, and Jamboree Attractions, and all of that stuff, four pages long. It's the one that you put together, and the lawyers accept it, signed by Parker, signed by my da dad, and signed by Tom Diskin, who was the uh, fellow that would look and make sure that this was okay, uh, a witness. You follow what I'm saying? So, I have that contract in my book so you can look at it after a while. And this could work for Parker. He did. And he's depicted in the movie as well. He is. He also owned a percentage of which Dad had to buy his stock along with Payne Parker to get 50%. Now, what does that mean? That means they're going to put up the money to rent stadiums, to do the advertisement, to pay the extra artists that we're going to have on. I made $350 per night at that time as a singer. He made 300 to $450 per night. Got that? The difference between he and I was this. I rode in Dad's car so I didn't have to pay expenses. I didn't have to pay band members because I used Dad's band. I didn't have to concern myself about the motel because Dad paid for the motel. I'm his son, right? I got some political power here. So my $350 was share money. But Dad had two band members to pay. He had a pink Cadillac that he had to concern himself about payments. He had to pay his boys. He had to, he had to pay for his own and their motel and things along that sort. So his money didn't go quite as far as my money. So that was quite, a, quite an agreement that Parker was able to put together on those first three months, two or three months, before the major contract would ever be signed. That was signed here in this city, okay? And I'm here to tell you, my friend, they did not like, the family did not like Parker. They didn't trust him. I think they had a sixth sense. But because they knew my father from the past, and because they liked him, uh, 
they would, they would be willing, and Parker calls Dad on the phone. He's over there with RCA, Bob Neal, the RCA representatives, Bob Neal, and the guy that owns Sun, Rec Sun Records, Phillips. They're all going to have to decide, and the money's going to have to be paid for all of them. Dad says in his book, he has one whole chapter in the book about it. Dad says in his book, they could have, RCA could have got Elvis for $5,000. Wound up, they had to pay $45,000. Because by now, he has a hit record. And I think everybody knows Heartbreak Hotel. That changed everything. Correct? And so now, uh, they're all over there getting ready to sign the main contract, of which I brought back the one note. He's traveled with us. Okay, what about the traveling with us? I'll get to the note in a minute. It didn't matter that we were working in cities like Jacksonville, Florida. We worked in uh, one area in Alabama in the Super Bowl area there or where the football players play. The place was packed on one side. Mobile, Ladd Stadium. Mobile. Mm -hmm. One side packed. We had to put chairs at the 50-yard line so they could accommodate another 2,000 people. They had a makeshift stage right there. Johnny Tillerson was on that show, by the way. Carter family. Uh, I can't remember everybody. I have, actually, I have all the dates that we played on all these shows that Parker made out on his own stationery. And uh, because he had such a charismatic relationship with the people, Dad noticed this. Now, you've got to remember now the difference between Parker, between Dad, and between Elvis. And one thing that was different about my father than everybody, everything was all business with Dad. Everything. Everything had to be on time, had to be a certain way. So if we played Jacksonville, Florida, the football stadium, Elvis reached the point where Dad decided he should go on the last part of the first half before the intermission. Dad being the star would do the last half and close the show. You got that in your mind now? Well, Elvis was so much of an impact upon the audiences, even though they didn't know who he was. They wouldn't let him off the stage. How I know is because we sold things out in the front of these stadiums and huge places that we played in. And so we'd all be sitting down there, and I'd be one of them along with Dad's band members and other band members selling things that people wanted to buy. So when they'd come in and they're looking on the table like this, and they're looking, and they see his picture, they stop and they look at it, and they would ask one of us, who is this Elvis Presley? They didn't know who he was. Time and time again. Our answer was always, you'll find out. <laughs> That was always our answer. That's the only thing we'd say. You'll find out. So he'd go up on the stage and he would perform and the people would go nuts. So the show would run the first half as much as 20 to 40 minutes overtime because they wouldn't let him off the stage. So finally Dad, being a straight stand-up country singer, he realized the best thing to do was to have a meeting with everybody. So he called Elvis. We all got together. And this is what he said to Elvis. He said, Elvis, he said, you're doing a great job. Now, I'm there. I'm sitting there hearing this. You're doing a great job, and we're proud of what you're doing. And uh, wanted to find out if you would be interested if you and I swap. I'll close the first half, you close the second half, and stay on stage as long as you want. Well, he, he liked that. He wanted me, okay, that'll be fine. He's going to get to close the Hank Snow Show. So that's a big deal for a brand new artist. So obviously he did that. Let me tell you one of the things though. At one of the places, I can't remember whether it was Jacksonville or Mobile, <laughs> but because the show went on this way, it was difficult for any of us to be able to get to the dressing rooms from the 50 yard line to where all the football players had to change their clothes, so we just stand back behind and wait till the show was over. 
Well, once that show was over, then everybody had to hustle to the dressing room, and especially him and his two players, because everybody wanted a piece of him. So he'd take off running. I still have a picture in my mind of Bill Black carrying that big bass and running with 75 or 100 screaming women chasing him. Here's Elvis running for dear life, and these... These two pickers, because see, if they couldn't get him, they'd take one of the others, because we all had to run. Because it caused such an uproar that, you know, the rest of us, the rest of us had to run as well, because they grabbed something from us too. Of course, I ran slower than the rest. But ne nevertheless, nevertheless, we had to do that over and over many times in many different places. Not every place. Some audiences, when you go certain places, were a little bit different, but most of the time, they do that. And so that's the kind of stuff we had to put up with. Now, as time began to go on, people started telling stories that Hank Snow was jealous of Elvis Presley and uh, didn't want him on the show. Well, Dad wanted desperately to him to really, and me, all of the young ones that started becoming part of us, to make it. Because the more they did, the more he made, and the more Parker would make. You follow what I'm saying? And so that was very, very important to them. So he, that's the last thing in the world he would want to do. But the only thing that he had about him, he didn't understand why a country singer had to jump around and do all that stuff. Because he viewed Elvis, who was, by the way, on the Louisiana he ride down there, in Shreveport, Louisiana, so he was identified with country music. He would later move into his own world, but he would do something, what I said earlier, that no other artist could do. What was that? His recordings then started jumping over into the rhythm and blues, Cash Box and Billboard <clears throat> magazine into the number one territory. Then it would do the same thing in the pop field, and then it did the same thing in the country field, so an Elvis Presley record could be number one in all three genres of the music world of that day. That's what brought him in to becoming the king. Because, you know, there's a dispute going on today that, well, the Beatles should actually get that, or uh, Bill Haley ought to get that. He had to rock around the clock. By the way, he was a country music singer in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And when I worked a tour with him, I asked him, how'd you get into this? And he himself said, well, I've been singing country music in bars and beer joints for years. And he said, I come out with this song that hit the movie. And it wound up becoming a major, major hit, Rock Around the Clock. And that's where that DJ reached out and grabbed. Now, you're going to hear all kinds of stories. But folks, I was there. I was with him from that time up until 1958. So what happened in 1958? In 1958, I wound up getting this telephone call because my career started changing. Y'all remember the song, Treat Me Like a Fool, Treat Me Mean and Cruel? I recorded it first. He heard me doing it on the show dates we were working together. He liked the song. I think it's in one of his top ten favorites, as a matter of fact. And because that song did so well for me, a couple of years later, 59, I think it was, 58, 59, I don't remember exactly, but he then recorded and had a major hit on it. Another song, remember this one? How do you think I feel? I know your love's not real. Remember that one? Mm -hmm. I had that one out before, Love Me. And then, because I stood on the stage and watched him that night, we all wanted to look like him, dress like him, sing like him. Uh, I think I even did a little dance step here and there. I don't remember now for sure. <laughs> Tried. Of course, we weren't him, but people have a tendency to go along. And so I did record one of his songs, Mel Cow Blues. You can go on YouTube and see all my recordings. By the way, if you just hit Google and type in Jimmy Rogers Snow, you'll see everything you need to see about me. Every recording I did, you can play them. Everything I'm doing now, every place I worked, every 
buddy that I worked with, everything that's gone on in my life, it's all there on YouTube as well as my dad. Yeah. Let me ask you this, Jimmy. Meridian, Mississippi. The, the DVD cover there. You're sitting on the pink caddy hood with Elvis. On our way, yeah. Tell, tell them uh, before uh, the parade what you guys had to go do. Y'all stopped in the store. And take that okay. Uh, I'm riding with Elvis. We're on our way to the parade. 55. All of a sudden, you know, Elvis, we're cutting up. Would you believe that one of the things that Elvis Presley used to love me to do, if anybody knew was around that was a friend of his, they'd say, he'd say, imitate Winston Churchill for me. Because back then I could hit the voice and I could sound just like Winston Churchill and make one of his speeches. And he'd laugh. His, I didn't matter whether I did it 50 times. He'd want the 51 times. For some reason, and I didn't think it was all that funny, but I'd do it for him and I'd laugh at him. <laughs> Crazy. But we'd ride around and we'd joke. We'd tell jokes, you know, like we we're teenagers, right? And we'd ride around. So we're on our way to Marini, Mississippi for the Jimmy Rogers Day. And suddenly, he pulls off the road and runs into this paint store, Sherwin Williams Paint Store, and buys a bucket of paint, comes out, and paints his name on both sides of this brand new pink camera. Elvis Presley. Both sides. We get up on the fenders. I don't know who took the picture, but somebody took a picture of us sitting there. And evidently they knew enough to know who it was. Uh, not completely, but they, you know, they took the picture. I never thought a whole lot about that, them taking that picture until years later when I'm doing Grand Old Gospel Time, the program I told you about a while ago. Being the last program, I would stay on the stage and shake the people's hands because people were coming to the Grand Ole Opry by the thousands, especially in the summer, from all over the world. I mean, I would talk to Germans and Swiss people, people from South Africa, everywhere. So I'd always stay there. The other Opry people couldn't because something else is coming on after them. So they leave. So I'd bring the cast out, the ones that were on my program. We did something that none of the rest of them could do. And we'd shake hands, sign a few autographs for him and everything. And this lady's standing there, and I'm signing an autograph for her, and she says, I've got something I bet you'd like to have. I said, really? Showed me the picture, snapshot, of he and I sitting on the fenders of that car, and you can see his name. I got it here in the book. You can see it yourself. I blew it up, made it bigger, and put it in the book for that one reason. And that brought back a lot of memories <laughs> that day. It's incredible, man. It's incredible. <laughs> so I wanted to point out something that, that Jimmy said. This is trying not to let me talk in. And that I thought is important. It's, it's called character. Did you hear what he said? When he was going to Graceland and was going to tell his story, it was important to him to get it right. He actually went back and read his father's book so he could remember. He didn't just go and start telling stuff. So that's the difference between... And I'm not pointing out anybody at this moment, but I'm just telling you that some people value truth more than others. And truth is important, especially if you really care about history and you care about truth, truth is important, y'all. Yeah. And it can't change. And if you say the same thing, if you learn and you stick with it and you do what I call good business, you never have to remember what you said. You say the same thing every single time. And this man has character. And like he said, when he said he was going to come, he came. You know, this was a hard drive for him. He was a long ways from here. It's a three and a half hour drive. And uh, his uh, wife was nice enough to come with him. And I am proud to have him here. I can tell you that. Thank you. And he's got some really cool stuff to show. So, y'all will come up. He's got some pictures he can show you. That check that we were showing you, Parker signed it on the back. It was endorsed by the Colonel. So, he's got some really interesting things to look at. Uh, this is just a small part, too. <laughs> I'm sorry. Elvis, Elvis Jack, right? Yes. All right, so wait, wait. First off, before I do that, where are you from? Uh, we live in Florida, but from, I'm from Italy. You're from Italy. You said that a while ago. That's a really great yes, question. Yes, I'm from Italy. Florida now. 
I live in Florida now. We, uh, when we came from Italy, we moved to New York. I lived in New York for 50 years, 52 years actually. Married 50 years. That's awesome. And we're celebrating, we came this year to celebrate my husband's life because he nearly died last year. No way. He was in coma. Talking about when we were listening to him, I wanted to cry yeah. because God did give us this this grace now to here. make it here. That's incredible. Yes. That's yeah. incredible. I'll have to shake his hand. Yes. Here yeah, my George. Yeah. So you watch Glow Trotter yes. Butcher? Every week on Tuesday. On your Tuesday, new, I, I make sure. Your new Tuesday. show every Tuesday. Yes, it's our breakfast. We're now retired, so that's our breakfast relaxation. No way. Yes, I swear. We 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 just. We, we, I wish you would do more. Okay. Well, hey, I probably will. I probably yes. will. But that, just what you just told me, that makes makes me know what I do is worth it. Oh, it is 150%. I appreciate you, you. Yes, you make our day, as I said. You, the spa guy, we watch all of well, the I YouTube. Just talked YouTube. About we, we value truth. And yes. truth is so important to us. And, you know, exactly. some people don't like that. And that is but, why we watch your show. Hey, I, I'm because so glad I have someone like true. you watching this. It makes me feel good <laughs> that I have someone like you watching this. Thank you. It makes us feel good that that somebody's telling us the truth. And what the most important thing is, that you are the young generation and you value the truth. That's what that's what really is important. I've been young generation. Right. <laughs> exactly. Right. That's what I was, like, was going to say. Your parents raised you my right. My parents, my grandparents, I've been, I've had a lot of God good bless people you. in my life. God bless you, really. So you want me to autograph an Elvis show? Oh, of course, yes, yes. This was given to my husband for Father's Day from my son. Awesome. He's a police officer. That's awesome. <laughs> Alright, so I'm going to find a place yes, and I'm like, going to sign it. So yes, please. please. Whoa! I'm not even going to say what Elvis would say, I'm just thinking it. But these are Elvis Presley's sunglasses from my friend Glenn uh, Johnson. And these are pretty badass. And I um, thought you might like to check them out. Check the CCB out. There it is. Check that out. CCB, taking care of business. Cool. Who all have you had sign this right here? I see. Let me see who I see here. Let's see if I have Scotty Moore. Scotty Moore. GK. Yes. Jerry Schilling. Gordon Stoker. No way. You've had this a long time. Yeah, I have. James Burton. Mark James. Frank Page. He introduced KW, Elvis. KWKH. 1954. Did you just get Jimmy? Just got Jimmy. How cool is How cool yeah. is Jimmy tonight? Very cool. Very cool. I mean, he's, a, he's an icon to me. He's, yeah. a, he's a, he living legend. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Living legend. With Elvis. That's DJ. DJ. Glenn DJ. D. Harden. Who's down here? This is uh, that's the uh, Ron uh, Strauss there, the pilot. Ron Strauss, pilot. the pilot, yeah. TCB, and then you got Tish. Tish. You have there's Jimmy. Look at Jimmy's right there. That's yeah. pretty cool. Fresh autograph yeah. right there. Got Ronnie Tud. Where's Ronnie Tud at? Right in the middle. So yeah, you have a lot of people that's not yeah. with us. And then look here, uh, Red Robinson, who introduced yeah. Elvis in '57. Where's he at? Right here, MC. He was the MC in Canada. Red Robinson, MC right in Canada. Wow. Red Man, Young, Kirk Billy. Billy. Billy? Yeah. Uh, all the Memphis boys, so, even so, Mike Leach. What do you do with this poster? You proudly just. I, no, I just, I just I collect. I'm a collector. I enjoy it. It's my hobby. I hear you. So now, who you got to get? You need to get Lisa. Well, Miller. I think we're just about done with this. <laughs> Fill another one up? Yeah. That's pretty cool, yeah. man. Well, I appreciate you guys coming out tonight. Oh. You said you did enjoy it. Oh, oh we enjoyed it, yeah. It's yeah. And last game. night also. You were at the movie too. I, I was, and I found out about this through yeah. last yeah. night. So, so, you guys are doing a great job. Like, was oh, absolutely, and so is this. I just felt like that's an experience that yeah. I would like to experience. Yeah. So, I figured other people would be like it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I guess I'm like, yeah, yeah. Around the <laughs> All right, so next, next time we do an event, be watching. You never you know what it's okay. going to be. And you need to come to Shreve. Y'all need to come to Shreve. Yeah, I, uh, I talked with one of the girls as a part of the publicity, and they're going to let me come in and film. Good. Oh, at okay. the auditorium. Good. Okay, so and I, then meet Sonny Trammell. you got to talk to him. Okay. Yeah, Sonny Trammell okay. um, was the steel guitar player that when Elvis played on the Hayride starting out. He didn't, you know, he didn't end up with the steel guitar sound. He didn't like it. But Sonny played on, you know, There's the up there, some so of his he, appearances. Yes. yes. 
Okay. Yeah. Can y'all get me in with him, or can y'all set that up? We have to talk to his son. We, we can. We'll, we'll, we'll figure a way. Yeah, out. might be so. We'll think about. Let's, let's <laughs> yeah. think about that. Yeah. Touch with. Yeah. All right. Hey, I appreciate you. All right. You're welcome. Hey, thank okay. you. Thank you. T T dot TV, and you got it. You can get it on your iPhone, you can get it on Facebook, you can pick it up. I put it on, I put my program on Facebook every week. So if you become my friend, you can get it. Okay. Right. Just let me know where you saw me. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Because I get a lot of these actors. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah. We'll so get guys, it tonight, don't worry. Yeah. Guys, how did y'all enjoy Jenna tonight? Oh, absolutely, oh, absolutely, absolutely love it. Love it. Love it. Hey, that was, that was so something special. Unbelievable, right? it is. Definitely and it's always was. good to hear the truth. I'm, I'm very yes. grateful. That's what we I really are big appreciate. on the truth. Well, we this are is too. the first time I've done something. That's all I'm about. That's all I'm about. So I want you to sign this, too. I bet it was. Yes. No doubt. But I enjoyed it. We're really excited about meeting you guys, too. Yes. That's crazy. Yes. I just like it. We watch you guys' videos all the time. So much stuff. So much stuff. Man, lots of yeah. time. Because I see what you guys bring to us, man. That's See, when you tell amazing. me stuff like that, I, I'm like, I look what I'm doing. Yes, it's like, you got to keep going. Oh, this, this one time I went to bed. Oh, I, Three o'clock in the morning, bro. Yeah, I think oh my God. Yeah. And I got up at night yeah. to do this all over again because I had to get that video from last night out. Yes. I had to do it. Man, yeah. yeah. it does mean more than you know. It means yeah. a lot to us. It does. Yeah. Yeah. It, really it really does. does. Well, you we know watch it on YouTube time. right now. So. Oh my God. <laughs> hey, I'm always with a camera. Hey, you are. Absolutely. But, well, that's good. Right. Jimmy's I see you again. Yeah. Yeah. He's fantastic. Okay. He is fantastic. Okay. All right, yeah, I'll definitely sign it. special edition, Elvis Presley, whatever, because Parker was trying to stick him in and show him. Sure, because he had the idea of bringing some young people. Come back.